Здравствуйте, my fair weather friends, and welcome to another episode of Kachimuchi's Game and Spooks. Valentine's Day. Not really a holiday most people associate with creepypastas. Yet ever since I heard this particular creepypasta, my mind always goes back to it on Valentine's Day. Considering all the pain, suffering, and tragedy that's caused in this world by love, it's a wonder there aren't a million more creepypastas about Valentine's Day. The only one I can recall is this one, in fact, although it isn't particularly about Valentine's Day. This story is about a man expressing his love to a woman that he's had his eye on for a very long time. And instead of bearing chocolates or flowers, he bears a single letter. Inside the letter describes the events the man underwent tirelessly in order to gain her affection. What will this man do for love? Well, this is a creepypasta. It should hardly come as a surprise. And so, without any further ado, let us begin. Your Secret Admirer by the legendary narrator, Creeps McPasta. I'm writing to tell you how I really feel. You probably didn't notice, but for the longest time, I have always been there for you. I want you to know what I've done, and I hope by me opening up to you like this, you will hopefully feel the same way for me. And we can be happy together forever. I remember when we were both thirteen, when you first transferred to my school. As soon as you walked in, I thought you were the most beautiful girl in the world. When your tranquil blue eyes crossed mine, even though it was for a brief moment, as you scanned across the strange faces in the class, I knew I wanted to be with you forever. But I was heartbroken straight away when you paired off with some other guy to show you around the school. You didn't really notice me much. You were always with your group of friends who were so, so different to mine. Who am I kidding? I've never really had any friends. The only thing that got me through all those years of loneliness was watching you, admiring everything you did. The way you gracefully went through your day without faults simply left me in awe, day in and day out. As the years went by, you seemed pretty popular with both the guys and the girls. You were sought after by all the popular guys in the school even by the older ones. But you shrugged them off. The girls loved how you looked after yourself. You always had your makeup and hair perfect, which made you admired, but hated. It's sad, but it's human nature to get jealous, and we are all guilty of this crime. What they ended up doing, however, was far out of line. I saw as they pushed you when the teachers weren't looking. They would shove you into any nearby hard objects, which more often than not was the wall. When you stumbled and slammed into the wall, the teachers would simply turn and say, Watch where you're going, dear, and then go about their business, blissfully unaware of what actually happened. Witnessing it happen every other day burned me up inside. Seeing you have this torment for being better than them, it was painful to watch every time it happened. I hoped it would die down, but it got worse. I saw when the bullies would knock your drink over when you least expected it, just because the most popular guy asked you out. I was there when they set your bag on fire in the woodworks class, because they thought you were condescending when you tried to help them with their work. And I caught a glimpse of that one time, when they actually threw you to the ground outside the school gates, and kicked you until you cried, simply because you tried to tell the teacher about what they were doing. After that incident, they followed you home. Usually they wouldn't do anything but yell abuse at you. The worst part is that you'd never know when they'd snap and suddenly attack you 
when walking inches away from your back. It tore me apart to see the girl I loved feel so vulnerable. I wanted to fix it. What I knew was that there were three main bullies that were consistent. I knew more, but they seemed to do it out of peer pressure. The main culprit was that narcissistic whore, Bethany. Beth was simply jealous of everything about you. All the things I mentioned that made you great burned her up inside. She used to be the center of attention. And my God, did she love it. All of the guys wanted to be with her. All of the girls wanted to be her. The only difference is that she abused this attention for personal gains. She slept with most of the guys who showered her in gifts or had their mommy and daddy to pay for everything. She only hung around with girls whom she deemed lower than her, and she did this so they wouldn't be a threat to her god complex. But slowly over the years of you being in the school, she eventually lost her reputation. By then, all the attention was on you. The second who had a disgruntled grudge against you was that asshole, Chris. He asked you to the school's annual dance in front of both his friends and yours, and you simply rejected him like many others. But what made his instance different was that he ran off crying because he was publicly embarrassed. In school, that meant a lot. He denied liking you and lost all his friends and reputation. So he took his frustrations out on who he thought had caused all of it. You. The last person was Julie. She had it bad for you, ever since the guy she liked always talked about how amazing you were, whilst not paying any attention to her. Even after she performed some, <laughs> well, let's say, desperate deeds for him. During the last week of school, I knew they had something special planned for you. So I took it into my own hands to deal with it, because I love you, and I didn't want your last few days at school to be ruined. The first person I convinced not to mess with you anymore was Chris. Now, he was much stronger than me, being into all the school sports. Plus, the steroids meant that I wouldn't be able to take him in a simple one-on-one -on -one fight. But in the end... That would be his downfall. I knew where he kept his steroids. It wasn't hard to figure out since our school's security and reputation was so low. There was no need in hiding it. I got his locker combination by simply saying I forgot mine. And the teacher gave me a list of everyone's combinations. Yeah, that's right. They have no sense of security in this school. I cracked open his locker with ease leaving no trace of it ever being opened. I found the next shot he was going to use, and squirted a little bit out, then pulled the plunger back to where it was, leaving a considerably sized air bubble. I figured Chris is no doctor, nor does he have any clue about how everything works altogether. He just injects himself and trains in the school gym, I bought a pass for the gym and pretended to train. He eventually came into the gym, laughing hysterically with his new friends. Enjoy it while you can. It's not going to last long, said a thought that crept into my head. He went to his locker, and not long after, he came out dressed in his training attire, with a determined look on his face. He was ready to start. He was fine for a while, but eventually slowed down. He had a puzzled look on his face as his body slowly gave up, and eventually the cardiac arrest settled in, and he was on the floor. People tried CPR, but there was no defibrillator around, since it was a school filled with teenagers. Who would expect a heart attack in a place like this? I smiled and walked out before the paramedics arrived. 
It was already too late for him. Working my way up the list, Julie was next. She was jealous of the way every guy liked you. I silently slipped through her window without her noticing. I knew her parents were out, so if she made a noise, no one would immediately come to her aid. I pounced on her while she was sleeping, pinning her down. I tied her hands to the bedpost, and then her legs. I pulled several jars from my bag, each one almost black. Upon closer inspection, you would see small movement. They were full of all the creepy crawlers that one would typically find in the bottom of anyone's garden. I took my time filling these up with every insect I could find. I wanted her to understand all the pain you must have felt, all the time she was shouting abuse at you, hurting you, making you feel lower than you really are. I propped her mouth open with one of those plastic rings a dentist would use for a long procedure. I slowly poured each jar down her throat. Every time, her screaming was muffled by a little more of the buzzing and scrattling noises the bugs made as they adjusted to their new home. Tears streamed down her face as I repeated all of this. Was for you. A few jars in and I could feel the bugs in her stomach, which is where I'd been sitting the whole time. By this time, she had pretty much passed out from the pain. When this happened, I'd wait, pour water on her face, and slap her until she responded. For punishment, I'd take the ring off her mouth and pour water down her throat, making her swallow all of the insects and causing them to go into a frenzy of panic. Eventually, during the fifth jar, the pain of all the insects burrowing into her internal organs plus all the internal bleeding, caused her to pass away. But not peacefully, of course. I saved the worst until the last. I had something special planned for Bethany. She was by far the worst to you. She made your life a living hell. And this was unacceptable. No one as perfect as you should ever have the displeasure of knowing these people. So I carefully set the pieces and waited. One day, I got a head start. I skipped the last class, but no one noticed. Not even the teacher. This shows just how much I was noticed in school. By this time, I had memorized her route home and waited in an archway. I knew she walked past this area every time. I waited and thought about what I was going to do and how it was all for you, although I didn't have to think so much, because I already had it all planned out. When I caught sight of her, I grabbed her and pulled her to the ground. She was kicking and screaming, but in this point in her journey, no one was ever around. The archway led to an abandoned, derelict church. I dragged her away from the path and to the building, so that no witness could intervene or find her body any time soon. I did my routine of securing her arms and legs to a post, so I knew that there wouldn't be that much of a struggle. After that, I gagged her, for I knew she'd make a lot of noise for what I was about to do. I slowly pulled out my knife, making sure she caught sight of its shiny glimmer. I placed the point of it on her lower leg and smiled as she reacted to the sharp point of the blade. I slowly pushed down, making sure the wound was clean as it slowly slipped into her flesh. It took a while, but eventually the knife's handle was touching her skin. I took my time pulling it out, making sure the wound did not rupture with all that easily recognized crimson liquid. That would have meant her death, 
and that would be too easy. As soon as the knife exited her body, I immediately wrapped the slit up with a bandage, applying enough pressure to cut the bleeding down to a minimum. Then, I placed the knife a little higher up on her leg, doing the same thing. I stared into her eyes as she helplessly watched me do this, over and over, all over her body. After each stab, I would say a remark about how you didn't deserve what she did to you. Eventually, her whole body was nothing but red bandages. She was barely conscious as I slit the final blow to her heart. I can imagine you're screaming about now. In fact, I know you'll be and I'll be close enough to hear it. And by you stopping, I know you've gotten this far into my letter, so I'll start making my way in. It's pretty easy to get into your house after the first few times. You probably thought it was your parents who left this note in your room in the first place. No, it was me. Don't be afraid of the noise downstairs. It's only me. Put down the phone. I know by now you've got it in your hand. But I've cut the phone line. Don't bother calling your parents, if you haven't done so already. I've already silenced them. You can stop your screaming now. I am always right outside your door. Unlock it now, and soon it'll just be you and me, together, forever. Lots of love, your secret admirer. The End And that was Your Secret Admirer by Creeps McPasta. Our main character certainly was in love, and nothing says I love you more than killing somebody. One unique feature of this story that I discovered by reading it was that it is told from the perspective of the supposed villain of the story. That isn't as common as it may seem, as most creepypastas are written from the perspective of the victim experiencing the events of the story. I especially enjoyed how Creepswing Pasta went into very disturbing detail as to how each of the characters in the story died. After all, besides the unhinged confession, the descriptions of the murders were the most disturbing parts of this creepypasta. Creepswing Pasta gave an appropriate amount of backstory for each of the victims, of which, at least from the main character's perspective, makes them deserving of their eventual fatal fates. Finally, I think the very concept of this story was an ingenious idea in and of itself. I believe most of us have heard stories about somebody doing something incredibly insane in the name of their love. And so, it seems only natural that a creepy post be made describing some of those insane things that a certain person would do for their love. This is displayed as a sort of twist at the ending, where it's implied that the letter was so long so that the main character could sneak inside of his love's house and confront her. At least we can assume that is the reason. After all, how could the main character kill the girl's parents, in addition to the girl not hearing anything about the students that bullied her every day dying beforehand? I'm quite certain somebody or anybody would have said something in the meantime. Also, come to think of it, how is it that this girl was popular in the first place if she was constantly being bullied all the time? I mean, where I come from, the people that were bullied usually weren't the most popular people in the world. Then again, Creeps McPasta is British, so perhaps things work a little differently across the pond. Who knows? I mean, Harry Potter was the most popular kid at Hogwarts, and he was bullied by somebody else. Maybe that makes sense after all. Well, before I carry on any more, let me extend a special thank you for watching or listening to this Valentine's Day episode of Kachimuchi's Game and Spooks. If you enjoyed this narration, why not do us a kindness and leave a comment 
or subscribe. And as always, feel free to leave any suggestions for stories for me to narrate in the future. This has been Kachimuchi, and that's about all I have to say about that. Farewell.